This episode is brought to you by Farmers Insurance. When was the last time you reviewed your insurance policy? So it's been a while, huh? Well, no worries. My friends at the Austin Brummett Agency would love to hear from you and provide you with some amazing rates. Give them a call at 678-402-8262 or email them at abrummett at farmersagent.com. That's A-B-R-U-M-I-T at farmersagent.com and tell them Harley sent you. Insiders, Inside the Bubble with Harley G is now sponsored by BetterHelp. As a partner of this episode, listeners can access the BetterHelp link located in the show notes to receive 10% off your first month of therapy with BetterHelp and get matched with a therapist who will listen and help. Go to BetterHelp, that is betterhelp.com slash inside the bubble, the link to get started. You're listening to Inside the Bubble with Harley G, the podcast for the superwoman. Every week, we connect with amazing individuals who share their inspirational experiences and stories while motivating an aspiring purpose. It's time to hang your cape. Grab your coffee, your water, your cocktail, and come on in Inside the Bubble with me, your host, Harley G. Welcome insiders to Inside the Bubble with Harley G. I have Tonya Paradin with me today. And uh, well, first of all, Tonya comes uh, uh, in uh, from a line of athletes. Like when I look at her and her dear, dearly um, past sister and your family, you guys have some amazing pictures in it. Um, a wedding that you you guys had mm-hmm. not too long ago. Mm-hmm. I'm like, how tall are these people? Like, like <laughs> the whole family is tall. Everybody's like tall. Like basketball yes, players, man. pro players, like nieces. <laughs> nephew. I'm sitting here like, okay, I didn't. Obviously, I did not get that gene because yeah. my parents just smurfs. My parents are so small. <laughs> I'm like, what what happened here? What happened? But anyway, so you have been through some challenges. Oh yeah. And. I look at you, Tonya. Um, Tonya and I work together, and I looked at how you show up every day. You are cool. You are calm. I'm like, is Tonya even capable of showing any? Like, n- not saying showing any emotions, but I was. Does anything ruffle your feathers? Like, oh, yeah. you are always cool, calm, and collected. And I'm sitting here like, and on the inside, I'm having a full blown fire. You know, <laughs> I'm sitting here like, oh my God. I need and to I'm learn having a fire too, but I've learned how to. <laughs> you, yes, but I'm just like, how. and then we, when we start talking, mm-hmm. I start hearing about these challenges or these situations that you have been in. And I'm like, mm-hmm. how? Mm-hmm. How? God. And I'm like, how? Jesus. How did you get through that? And how is it that <laughs> you're able to show up every mm-hmm. day? No, just so calm, so mm-hmm. peaceful, mm-hmm. and I want to talk about that a little Absolutely. bit because you've been through some stuff. You, oh yeah, you had a twin sister, mm-hmm. um, who passed away. Correct. Um, so you you've seen that you've been through that with her. Mm-hmm. You you had some challenges with yourself after that, right? Mm-hmm. Oh like yeah. You went through. So tell us a little bit about that. I'm going to I'm going to start from the beginning. I okay. feel like I think this people would benefit most by understanding like the whole Yes. story. Mm-hmm. I grew up in a household uh, my mom initially we lived in New York, mm-hmm. single mother. Mm-hmm. My father was incarcerated. I think mm-hmm. I've shared this. My okay. father was incarcerated when I was about 2 years old. And my mom was I call her the goat. No. The greatest of all time. She's amazing <laughs> yeah. and she um, basically raised four kids single-handedly. Four. I had my brother. Yes. Uh, my oldest sister was about 13 months older than me and then my twin. Wow. So it was four of us. So we're very close in age. So she had 13 months and mm-hmm. then she had twins. Mm-hmm. 
What? And my older brother. So my brother's <gasps> oldest. Yes. He's three years older, older. than me. Then okay, my sister, sister right after that. And yeah. then the set of twins. So she, all of us were like, not even school age. And oh she had us all together. Gosh. Okay. We lived in the projects in Staten Island. Mm. Um, and then my mom, who worked tirelessly. Mm-hmm. I'm always a professional. And mm-hmm. I, I get a lot of my characteristics from her. Obviously. Um, she's <laughs> super calm if you uh-huh. ever meet her. I mean, she's 80 now still. Thank God she's still with me. And... You know, if you have that example of a strong woman, Mm -hmm. you just kind of emulate what you see. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about uh, a mother having four kids single, you know, trying to raise them, it's incredible. Like, Listen, I'm mm -hmm. married and I have four kids. Sometimes I'm like, And so like how she did it was amazing. You you always have the community back then. Yes. I was born in 67. (laughs) 67 and so you have a community of um people that helped her too Mm -hmm. like friends that she's been friends with for 60 years um when i was about i guess about three she met my stepfather and that that completely changed the whole uh landscape of our life Mm because when she met him um fell in love Mm -hmm. uh, called l-u-v not (laughs) l-o-v and um when she met him, we moved to New Jersey. Okay. And it was quite rough because he was, he had been through a lot himself. Okay. And so we experienced a lot of physical punishments, which we oh. had not. My mom was more of a talker and communicated yes. more, um, mm-hmm. had those conversations, give you that eye, mm-hmm. your parents are, you better behave yourself. Right. And so it was a different type of uh, situation. So for mm-hmm. us, for me, it was very eye opening. Mm-hmm. You know, he had two sons. So it ends up being six people in a home. Mm with my mother and stepfather. And so we stayed, I was in New Jersey for most of my like middle and high Mm -hmm. school years. And that was kind of rough, honestly, you know, kind of being dropped into a situation where he's not really your dad, but you got to kind of get to know. But you got to respect him. Because my father was gone at that point. And so, you know, my mom was doing the best that she could. And that was just, it was a very interesting, I would, I would say, um, kind of scary mm-hmm. at times in terms of uh, some of the things that happened. But I feel like, you know, in retrospect, I don't think I'd be the person I was if I hadn't gone through those experiences. Mm-hmm. Very rough, mm-hmm. very strict. Mm-hmm. Um, people couldn't believe, like, there were six kids in the house. It was super clean. Our house was very organized and neat. And, you that know, not the case we were always house. in place. You know, everything was always yeah. just so. And that's probably where I get a lot of my organization now, yes. you know. Uh-huh. And so... It was funny because I was 16. I always did well in school. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I got to get out of here because mm-hmm. my father, my stepfather was strict. My mom was always working. Mm-hmm. And so we went through things as a kid. Um, and so at 16, I was like, I'm going to excel. Did really, really well. Graduated early. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. ended up in school in college. Mm-hmm. Um, like the s- right before the end of my, I didn't even go, go to walk my graduation to high school because I was already on, in a, school. on a bus to BCU to wow. go to college. And so I um, went to BCU for four years, did not graduate because, you know, I recently graduated mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then um, just been all over the place. But I, when I think about it, um, after I left BC, BCU, my sister used to come visit my twin sister. Mm-hmm. Very, very interesting dynamic. My sister I was just going to ask, how was the dynamic super, of the relationship with oh my you gosh, and your sister? I could finish my sister's sentences. Wow. I mean, there were times... And you guys now, were identical, right? We were identical. Not that it mean, but... Yeah. We, like, we, I just feel like there's a little bit of extra... Yeah. ...when it's identical And times. my mom used to make these... She used to make comments. She said, you know, you guys be fighting and, t- you know, going at it. And mm-hmm. as soon as somebody tried to inject themselves... Oh, no. We would both turn on them, no. you know? <laughs> and she was like, ooh, let me leave these two mm-hmm. alone, mm-hmm. right? No. And, um, you know, and it, we went going to college... It was very interesting. My sister used to come mm-hmm. and spend time at my school in the summers. We go back and forth. She was at that time. Okay, so I have to ask you: yeah. Did you guys ever do the switch up? Not in per- on purpose. People oh, used to, people okay, would get, okay, people okay. Would get, <laughs> <laughs> people would think what by like I was in BC and she come and spend the summer. Yes. She get a little job like uh-huh. local one of the uh-huh. malls and stuff. And she'd be walking around BC and people yeah. think that she was me. You, but she okay. always used to say, "Yeah, yes. my twin sister." Okay, got it. We didn't really try to do that people okay. would think it was me I so just, you know hey yeah and then <laughs> my sister went to i always wanted my sister to go to school with me and she oh. was like i want to you know she for some odd reason i could never i wanted to go to bc so bad uh-huh and she did not want to go i don't and so when i in retrospect I'll, I'll talk about my thoughts on mm-hmm. that one but she ended up going to iowa state where my older sister was which okay. i thought was interesting i'm like why would you want to go to iowa it's so far you know <laughs> I know. So she went to Iowa for a year and then didn't like it. It was cold mm-hmm. and ended up um, 
coming back to New Jersey and going to St. Peter's College. So, okay. again, we were, like, going back and forth. I'd uh-huh. go with St. Peter's, spend, you know, some time there. Yeah. She'd come back to VCU. And while she was at in St. Peter's College, she met her future husband. Okay. He was visiting. from the Netherlands. Mm-hmm. And so um, that's kind of the start of the journey of, okay. you know, the Netherlands. Yes. She came to visit a friend uh-huh. who played basketball at St. Peter's College um, on the men's team. My, my sister played on the women's team. Mm-hmm. And that's how they met. They okay. Met. Okay. And so that's the transition to the Netherlands. So you understand what yes. that comes from. We were okay. always back and forth. I go to her yes. games and she comes to my school. Okay. And I can remember when we were very close. I mean, sending like we both broke college students. Anytime we didn't have something, she'd be sending me a few dollars. I sent <laughs> yeah. her a few. It was just like that. So um she um she played basketball for I think two years and volleyball for a year. Mm-hmm. Didn't graduate either. We were the same in that aspect. So we're twins, really. And then met her husband. And then, you know, they talked for about two years. And then finally she made the decision. Oh, I'm going to go live in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh. That's what I was going to say. How did you feel about that? That's far. Devastated. Devastated. I think um, for me, it was like devastating. Like, oh my God, my sister's going to be, you know, so far away. away. You know, And um, of course, she wasn't going without being married. So... I mean, at that point, they had a really good relationship. He was mm-hmm. writing letters, all kind of stuff. He was writing us letters, my oh, mom's letters. He's a really good guy. Yes. And so, to this day, I'm still friends with him. He's remarried. Mm-hmm. I call him brother, you mm-hmm. know. And um, so, they got married in New York and moved to the Netherlands. And I cried through the whole wedding. Oh. I, was, I was her maid of honor. Mm-hmm. I guess it's, Maid of honor. If you sure were not right. married. If you're not married, it's, what is it's, it? If you're married, it's matron. If you're not married, oh, it's maid. Oh, maid of honor, because yes. I was not married. <laughs> So, <laughs> so I cried through the whole wedding. It's kind of, it's in a little way, I was like a little embarrassed, kind of selfish, but no. I was cr- literally crying through the whole wedding. But that is I mean, twin. sobbing. When I tell you sobbing, it was like, don't take no pictures of me because all you <laughs> see is red eyes. And yes. it's all I kept thinking is she's going to go to the she's, Netherlands. She's leaving. She's, she's going to go. So do you feel like there was a void there? You know what's really funny? And I mean, she that was in 1991. Mm-hmm. And when I think about it, we still stayed close, which is crazy because mm-hmm. back then you couldn't call as much. It was super expensive. Yeah. We would write each other letters. We still would wow. send care packages. Yes. It was very different. We didn't really have... We don't, we have, so we don't of, have technology. We like didn't we have email. Then. It was crazy. Like, we, we, we didn't, didn't have beepers. But you know something? I, I knew everything that was going on. We would wow. do phone calls maybe once a week or once yeah. every couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. And we were very mindful of the time. She yeah. had these crazy phone bills. Crazy phone bills. And so I would call her. I was living at home with, with my mom at the time. I came back from school. Mm-hmm. And um, it was amazing. Even though you would think, and I think about technology now, how mm-hmm. people are disconnected with iPhones and all these devices and FaceTime. We had nothing, none of nothing. that, and we stayed very connected. I knew That's everything crazy. that was going on, yeah. all the little jobs she had in the Netherlands. Yeah, you know, when, for, when she got pregnant, you know, mm-hmm. all of that was. All, we just somehow managed to share those things yes. through letters and See. through the few phone calls that we made. We stayed right. very close and um, would go to visit her frequently. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can't even tell you how many times back and forth. Either we kind of alternated years. She yes. would come, and I would go. Right. And she lived there for eleven years. Yeah, she lived there for 11 years. And it was funny. The interesting thing about it is I had met my husband um, about three years before she got sick. And I'm, I'm very horrible with, with uh, dates. Mm-hmm. And so Rowan was born in 99. So I want to say I met him in like 96, mm-hmm. 97, something like that. And we dated for like two and a half years. Mm-hmm. We got married. Six months later, I was pregnant with my daughter, and that's when I found that she was sick. Oh, okay. So it was so like how, it's like really interesting. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then you know, so she got she was sick with breast cancer. Mm-mm. What is she it? had um, colon cancer? Colon cancer. But the okay. interesting thing about it is a year before, I do remember this vividly. My my other sister in law, my brother's wife, was over there because he was playing professional ball in Belgium. See. And they would spend Christmas together, so uh-huh. he would come from Belgium to the Netherlands, and they right. would spend the holidays right. together. Because we, we a lot of alternate back and yes. forth trying to work it out for family, <clears throat> and so he was there. And my sister in law was braiding her hair, mm-hmm. and she was sitting on the floor for a while. You know how long it takes to put you mm-hmm. know those braids in your hair, and she went to get up, go to the bathroom, it was just complete bleeding. Oh, that's okay. kind of like the start. The but beginning. she went to the doctor, and they uh-huh. totally mis- misdiagnosed her at that what? point. Yeah. Okay. Because she was it young. Was, she was yeah. How old was 20, she? 28 years old. <gasps> and so it's very uncommon to be in your 20s to be yes, that Yes, to sick. be full-blown. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
diagnosed she was 28. with colon cancer. Yeah, she was 28. And what stage, is, what did they say, did we know? Well, we didn't know at that point because she, um... Ladies, I know there's so much to do and not enough time in the day. Trust me, I'm right there with you. But what are you doing for yourself? Well, I've recently discovered Body Bar Pilates. Let me tell you a little bit about it. Body Bar Pilates will challenge all of your major muscle groups and provide you with a full body workout. Wow. Listen, I had to check it out. I took a class with Sherelle and it was amazing. They have workouts for all skill levels, whether you're just starting out or you're just looking for a new way to move your body. This is the community for you. Check out my friends at Body Bar Pilates East Cobb or give them a call at 678-941-4371. And don't forget to mention me, Harley G. She had that incident. She went to the doctor. They said it was, you know, ICF. She, she had just had, I think, she had Courtney after that, mm -hmm. around that time, a little bit after. And so they thought it was like hemorrhoids, because, you know, we oh, all get all that stuff from yeah, yeah. from um, childbirth uh -huh. and stuff. She had two kids, very large ones, and both mm -hmm. over 10 pounds. And they pushed what? in the bedroom. They don't oh get any. They don't gosh. get any extra help over there. They gotta push those babies out with no anesthetic. I could see that's why I cannot live in the. She got a little shot in the hip, and she had to push them ten, ten, ten pound. I give her. I call her like a champion. That's a soldier. Delivering right there. two babies over ten pounds. No, with mine nothing. was nine pounds, and I said, "Is there still time for the drugs?" Okay, I need the yeah, drugs. Okay. So. And so, yeah, they kind of misdiagnosed that, and then she was fine for a little while. I remember visiting her. Um, and she was complaining about her stomach all the time and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then she kept going back and forth to the doctor mm -hmm. again and did little things. And, you know, a year in, that's a year later after the whole incident with, um, with my sister-in-law braiding her hair and still misdiagnosed and she's young. What mm -hmm. could it be? And, um, she went to her, they call them, um, like a house doctor. Cause they actually would come to your house, which is oh, really interesting. And, see yeah. you. and she would always tell him what was going on. He's like, Oh, here, take this set pill. And set pills like, you know, it's positive, mm -hmm. you know, to work, to try to treat whatever it was. And then three years in, she had started getting a big belly. Oh, okay. And that's about the time we got mad when I got, actually got married to my husband because that's when we really thought we realized it was serious yeah, because yeah. My, it was so funny because um, I was preparing to get married and she came in for the wedding. And I'm like very non finicky when it comes to these type of details. Mm -hmm. I was like, be comfortable. I'm not worried about any of this, mm -hmm. you know. And my mom's like, she got kind of a little belly. And it wasn't, I don't think she was really saying it like because she, you know, gained weight or anything. She just thought it was interesting. Like, she didn't want to wear stockings. Like, don't wear stockings. Like, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm real easy with this yeah. stuff. And so it was a very small wedding. And I was like, she said, I don't feel that great. And I said, fine, just do whatever you need to do. I just mm -hmm. want you. You know, right Here. there. Yes. And, um, you know, she, we did the wedding thing and got married and it was a beautiful day. I was, it was like amazing. The whole thing. She came by herself because mm -hmm. the kids were at home mm -hmm. and her, her husband was at home. She always, she would always make sure she was there. Even if the kids couldn't come mm -hmm. or she couldn't afford to like bring everybody. Yeah. She was always yeah. going to be there. And so right after that, um, I would say like fast forward about six months. She called me on the phone. I remember standing there and I just found out I was pregnant with Rowan. Mm. I was about four months pregnant. Mm -hmm. And she said, I just got a call from the doctor. She finally went back. This is like probably After three years from these, that. Yeah. yeah. And the doctor said that they detected some type of like, they think it was, they didn't say what it was, but mm -hmm. they were thinking it was cancerous mm -hmm. because of the weight was, was growing. Was, yeah. And she was scheduled to have a surgery. Um, or take a look at it. So have some kind of scan. We're going to send her to Amsterdam to Amse Hospital, Amsterdam to have a look at it. Mm -hmm. And then um, I was on the first plane out, literally mm -hmm. got on a plane pregnant and mm -hmm. went out there. And I remember her coming in the door and telling me that it was, it blew my mind. Like I was just, I, I didn't even know what to do with myself mm -hmm. when they said it. I was in, I was in Irving at the time, living with my husband. We hadn't moved to Orlando yet. And when they said it, I thought, cancer? Like, nobody in my family, everybody was athletic. Nobody yeah. Did. No, you know, we didn't. Not like, that's, that's for guaranteed. people that are, like, old and, uh, uh, no, no offense, I, but it's I like. Can, it's so vivid in my head. Yeah. On that day, Harley, when I think about it, I was like, how could that be? Like, you just wonder, how is this possible, right? And um, I thought, you know, I'm having a, a child at that point, mm -hmm. and I, I was trying to be mindful of what my head was at, because I totally understood that. You know, being pregnant and 
the, the state all of the of mom that, and yes. all I was very conscious of that. And so she was like, well, they're going to do a major surgery because at that point she was having issues like, like it was like a backup because what happened was that whatever the tumor was it kind of started growing and it was blocking her intestines when she, oh, when she swallowed and stuff was just yeah. building up. And so they did a surgery and I, this is like fast forward a few more months. I'm not really with the time frames here, but a few more months fast forward. She had this surgery at this time, like eight, nine months pregnant. So I couldn't go back over there. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, she had the surgery. I'll never forget it. She had the surgery in Amsterdam. They took out like about a third of her intestine, mm-hmm. a bunch of tumors. Um, they took out, she had a full hysterectomy because it had, some of it had seeped on her like ovaries mm-hmm. and all that. And I remember my sister saying all she wants to do is just like have the belly go back down because she ended up looking very pregnant mm-hmm. from all of, and she was very athletic. So yeah. she was like, she wasn't used to, you know, mm-hmm. and even if we were, we were large women, we never had like bellies. big bellies, yes. you know, so, yes, yes. and so she was like, I just want my belly to go back down. So I feel pregnant. And yeah. so she comes out of surgery and the guy did a surgery like four and a half hours that they operated on her. Mm-hmm. And her actual home doctor felt guilty because he felt like he had misdiagnosed her when he realized well, she was pregnant, I mean, so he felt a little guilty. Yeah. But I'll never forget the doctor's name in Amsterdam. His name is Fundefelder. Okay. That was her doctor who did the surgery. Uh-huh. And um, after she had the surgery, listen to this, because she, she was like, at that point, she kind of like, she never said wise me anything when she's going through all this process, which I learned a lot from that. I'll talk more about that, but she uh-huh. really um, taught me a lot. So she was saying after the surgery did all the surgery four and a half hours and they was like they didn't see her like getting out of the hospital for probably two to three weeks Mm -hmm. she was out in the hospital in three days the next day she was up walking around the third day they sent her home she had a decision from here like to here and and when i think about that that was god too because and she never asked why it's me. She never asked any questions. She said, why not me? It's like, I don't think because, you know, something's good. It's always, you know, I, I can accept that. Mm-hmm. But then when something's bad, bad, it's yeah. always why me. Yes. And so that comes with life. And for someone at 29, 30 years old to say something like that, and I'm witnessing all the suffering and the stuff she was going through. And for her to say, why would I say that? Mm-hmm. You know, all of that is part of, is part of life. Yeah. And so I was like, like observing all of this stuff and seeing her go through the surgeries and seeing her, you know, go through the radi- the chemo- chemotherapy. She didn't do radiation. And all of the things that she heard, she never was negative. She never said, why is me? People used to come and still talk to her and she would sit down and listen and try to encourage them. It is something I carry with me to this day. Like, I feel like of all the things that have occurred in my life, that thing is so powerful when you see mm-hmm. someone that is suffering, literally suffering. And they, I mean, they not a negative it. thing, yeah. never question it. They, it's like, it's a part of life. And, um, to watch that was humbling. Whew. That's the only thing I, that's the best way I can explain it. Mm-hmm. And so she had that surgery, came, went back home. She did great for like three years. Wow. Okay. She, I remember her telling me the story. She went to have the, the um chemotherapy and at one point she said she she started praying mm-hmm. and she's like god she goes she would stand in the mirror she had this thing that she wrote in her bedroom about i am healed mm-hmm. i'm whole and she would say this affirmation each day and then she went to um that when i think she had had about six treatments and the seventh treatment seventh treatment she sought she decided she didn't want any more chemo and so she walked in and they couldn't believe that she was sick because she would walk in with her backpack on this elevator. She'd take the stairs. She lost a lot of weight. Like mm-hmm. I said, she was athletic. And so she lost a lot of weight. She would, she would just come up and then she'd walk in and be like, why are you here? And, I'm mm-hmm. saying, and they'd be like, no, this is after all that surgery and stuff. Yeah, well, I'm here for the chemo. And they would look at her like she was crazy. Never lost because the hair off her think, head. Yeah. Never lost any hair on her head. Anything. It was crazy. Like it. You know God was totally in control yes. of, when I look back on it, the mm-hmm. power of the spirit. Mm-hmm. And she didn't lose any hair. I guess radiation causes it, but chemo, I yes. mean, chemo, mm-hmm. I mean um, mm-hmm. chemo can cause it. She didn't lose one hair on her head. And then she had this six cycles of chemotherapy, and then she stopped. The doctor what was from, her thought process in stopping the chemo? She said God spoke to her. Hmm. She let okay. it go. Okay. She said, I... And at that point, she decided, because she was a stage four, I told you that at that point, they had mm-hmm. taken everything out, they had mm-hmm. taken a third of her test, all of that stuff. 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna enjoy my life. And I feel like this is gonna take away. Well, she at that point she was thinking she was healed anyway because she mm-hmm. said I've been having a conversation with God and I'm healed. And the doctor Funderfelder asked her to do a symposium in Amsterdam because they her case was so unusual mm-hmm. because of her age and right. the fact that she had that surgery and popped up the day later right. and you know literally left the hospital two days later uh-huh. like normal like I mean yeah. of course she was still sore right but the way she was functioning was like on some next level so they yes. were like they were trying to understand it. And so she was invited to be a, on a panel of people in Amsterdam to talk about her illness. Mm-hmm. There were three people on the symposium panel. She was on it with two elderly people. <laughs> and so there's a, a big field of doctors that are learning. Mm-hmm. And the moderator said um, in the symposium, and don't again, dates, I don't remember, I remember her story, but she was saying that they told her medical history. They told them, they said, this patient, without giving the name, mm-hmm. this is the medical history, it's a stage four and um, had had the following procedure and mm-hmm. all that stuff removed. And and they asked the doctors, about a room full of about 40, 50 doctors, who do you think on this stage is the person that has that medical history? Because typically with colon cancer, it's with elderly people. Right. So they all picked the older The older person. people, yeah. And here my sister sitting up there, like looking like healthy <laughs> as all get out. <laughs> And then they asked him to ask the person with this medical history to stand up. And she stu- st- stood up and all of them got really emotional. Yeah. Because it's typical of how we view the, you know, the world. We have a, a box. We see yes, everything. Yes, exactly. And then when this happens, like, it's like a jar. Like, I need you to pay attention. Don't mm-hmm. worry about the age. Like, when you see these things happening. Exactly. As a doctor, you need to pay attention. And so she told her story. Uh-huh. And um, it, it's, it's, it's super interesting because she told, tells her story anyway. And... Hopefully those doctors learn from that experience mm-hmm. and not to miss, you know. But um, when I think about the whole thing, I just was watching her and then, you know, fast forward three years, she got sick again, but mm-hmm. she started having headaches and metastasized to the brain. I did a lot of trips back and forth, but just got a chance to kind of be there and watch. Mm-hmm. And Harley, you know, again, to see someone suffering and to never have like a view of the world that's negative, like just appreciated everything. Tried to talk to her kids through the whole thing. You know, we would I would talk to her and it was like people would still come to see her and share and and she's always still trying to do things herself. Mm-hmm. She would, it's 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 mind blowing to go through something like that and then when you look at your own life, you're like, This is kinda little. Like I'm not gonna ever <laughs> see my life the same. Mm-hmm. When you see someone going through that. Mm-hmm. And I don't know where she got the strength. But she did tell me one day, she says, I am looking for quality, not quantity. Mm-hmm. And she was, when I tell you total control, mm-hmm. they wanted to do all the stuff there. And she was like, nope. Nope. I'm not doing it. She decided that she I'm was going to be in total control. Wanted, yes. Yeah. And she I knew wanted. she was going at it. So we, yeah. And I remember Dr. Cohn, I was there visiting. He was trying to get her to do a surgery on her head. And she was. he calls up and he's really upset because she left the hospital. Mm-hmm. She was supposed to stay. To stay. And I was there visiting. And she wouldn't talk to him. She asked me to talk to him. And so I, they hand me the phone. I was like, she doesn't want to come back. And he's like, she's going to die. And I heard her say, she heard him say it. And she goes, he said, and then, and my sister <laughs> said it. She turns around. She goes, we're all going to die. <laughs> she turned back around like, that was her response. Like, <laughs> okay. We're all going to die. Right, she said, right. But I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a, I'm a have a little say on mine. Yes, right exactly. That's how she dealt wow. with it. Mm-hmm. How was her kids, her husband, mm-hmm. like, what would they, did you have conversations with, I'm sure you had some conversations with them, but mm-hmm. what, how were they like dealing with all of this? I mean, they were little. I mean, Quincy was like 11, 12. Courtney was probably like four or five. Mm-hmm. And she was always trying to push them to do what they needed to do for themselves. Mm-hmm. Like she talked to them, constantly talking to them. But she wanted them to live their life. Like she didn't want them to be soaking over her or laying in the bed and, my brother-in-law is very bushy, and so <laughs> he was trying to do his best, and he did, he's very emotional, mm-hmm. and they had a really good relationship, but I think at the, in the end, it was more, she wanted people not to be, like, sad mm-hmm. and devastated, so she mm-hmm. tried to, like, go do what you gotta do. Yeah. You know, go go out there and play with your friends. Yeah. Or, she would talk to them and stuff, uh-huh. and love them, up on them, and hug them, and, but she didn't want them to be consumed mm-hmm. about what was happening to her. She mm-hmm. tried to talk to him. Okay. But the only thing that made it tough, like on my niece, was that towards the end, my sister had 
the cancer metastasized to her brain and it developed some pressure. And what happened was her eyes started to kind of come out a little bit. Oh, wow. And so that was hard because yeah. her appearance changed. Yeah. And so that made it tough on my, and then I think my niece, my niece, is a little afraid, mm-hmm. just a little bit. Yeah, because she's little. She she's little. She's exactly. She's seen, so exactly. it's a little scary to see mom's yeah. eyes, you mm-hmm. know. And um, she still tried to talk. She was still very loving, mm-hmm. and she did a good job with those kids. I almost feel like she tried to pack in, pack in a whole lifetime in yes. like six years. You know, you know what's interesting, Harley. And then in retrospect, I go back and think about some of the stuff my sister said. We were we were younger, like in high school, and she would say things like. We'd be sitting there talking. She goes, I just don't see myself after like 2000. Like, I remember her saying that. What? It's almost like, I feel she like knew. in the spirit, I feel like in the spirit, your spirit knows, but your flesh and, you know, yeah. sometimes doesn't. But I can distinctly remember her saying that she doesn't remember her life. Like, she doesn't see her life after Past. 2000. She wow. died in 2001 in January. And so this is the crazy part. When I'm in retrospect, when I think yeah. about all the stuff about her life, it was almost like I feel like the spirit knows. Yeah. And then you just kind of like I, I don't even know how to explain it to people, but I feel like my sister knew in a way in a very young age. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when it all happened, I, it just like oh my goodness, like all the stuff that she would mm-hmm. say and do with the kids. At one point, she even told me, and I wasn't married at the time. I looked at her like she was crazy. So she said, hey, if anything ever happens to me, you can marry Eddie, which is my brother-in-law. Wow. She was like literally handing over her husband to me saying, if anything ever oh. happened. I looked at my sister like, oh, no. You we're, not, we're not doing that. <laughs> and she was serious. Yes. She goes, and I was like, I, why is she saying this? It was almost like she knew. Yeah. I feel like sometimes if you're really in tune, my sister's yes. spirit, she was very in tune. Yes. That you, 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 she understood certain things. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, when I think about the whole thing, how connected we were, I could feel stuff like mm-hmm. through the whole process. Mm-hmm. I knew when I needed to be there. I think at the end, you know, she passed in, in January of uh, 2001. And the weird part is, I can tell you everything I was doing that day, but I always still to this day don't know the exact date in 2001. It's like a block. Mm-hmm. I'll look at it and I forget it instantly. But I remember her, my brother-in-law calling because I'd been there in 2000, October and December, because mm-hmm. I came for our birthdays in October, and I came, I came to the Netherlands again in December, mm-hmm. where I came from the first to the 17th. So I left right before Christmas, and she was very ill at that point. And I used to lay in the bed next to her and just hold her and stuff. And she was very thin; she lost a lot of weight. But in my mind, I just didn't see her gone. Like I, I, you mm-hmm. know how I don't care how much. You embrace like death or, or life. You just never, for somebody is that close to you, you just never can see that. Do and you, even though she was very ill, yeah, you know, when I walked out of it, I just felt like this is not the end kind of thing. And I remember her, she was sick. When I say really sick to the point where you really wasn't eating that much, it, again, she probably down to about 160, 170 pounds for us is like really small. Yeah. And so I remember leaving that day on the 7th. Now, this date I remember, 17th of December, getting ready to get a flight back to the U.S. I still have my daughter at home. Mm-hmm. And getting up off the bed, because we were laying in the bed together, and standing up. And I was like, you do not have to get up. And she goes, no, I have to get up. She got out of the bed. And she gives me this hug, and she's just holding me. And that was? That was the last, the last time I hugged my sister. And I, she said, I have to get up. It's like she knew. Mm-hmm. I, in my heart, wasn't really Ready. taking that in. Yeah. I wasn't yeah. taking it in. Mm-hmm. Even though I was right there, I was like, mm-hmm. I wasn't, there was no way that my sister could be gone. Yeah. So I'm like, she going to make it through this. I don't, you know. And so when she got, I just didn't want her to get up. I was like, you don't have to get up. It's mm-hmm. okay. No, I need to get up, she said. Now, as sick as she was, she got up yeah. out of the bed and gave me a hug and I just held her. And like a couple of weeks later, my brother-in-law called me. She was having more difficulty and she wasn't swallowing and all that, that stuff. So again, I popped the bed off the plane again. Yeah. And I was back over there. And I, again, I don't remember dates, but I remember being on the flight Delta Airlines, the mm-hmm. miracle of that whole experience. I remember calling the airline. I'm sorry, TWA back in the day. I'll tell you mm-hmm. how far long ago it was. <laughs> TWA. <laughs> TWA Airlines. Oh yeah. And I remember um, on the you know calling the airline and saying, hey... You know, I'm, I need to get a flight to the Netherlands, Amsterdam. Mm-hmm. And my, my sister's very sick. I was very emotional. Because my brother-in-law had called me. She wasn't swallowing. So I said, I got to be there. And I knew in my heart I could not be there to watch my sister transition. Mm-hmm. I, 
I was not who I am today. If I was, mm-hmm. if I who I am today back you, then, like understood, you, yes, I would probably be okay have... with holding her through the whole process. Right. But something in me could not handle yeah. it. Yeah. You know. Mm-hmm. But I remember calling the airline TWA. This lady was amazing. I told her my sister was very ill. I was trying to get there to see her. Harley, and you know those flights back then were still just almost as expensive as they are now. Oh, absolutely. I got a round trip flight to Netherlands. It was less than five hundred dollars. I'll never forget it. They put what? me on a plane the same day. Wow. I flew out that night with a backpack. I had one pair of underwear in there, a pair of pants, and a and a shirt. Mm-hmm. And I was on a plane. I landed at ten fifteen. No, I landed at ten thirty. She died at ten fifteen. <gasps> So I hit the ground. I was literally in the process of landing when she passed and I could feel it. I could feel it. And so I remember taking the, I took a taxi to the house because it's about an hour away and I got to the door and he said she was gone. She was still in the house because she, mm-hmm. she passed, passed away home so I go up and I sat with her and, it, and I just sat there, you know, and then Eddie told me, you know, how all of the details. But I just sat there and I was just so devastated. Like I just, I don't know, it's, it's hard to explain to people. Mm-hmm. But I always still like feel like she's still with me and I'm going to share something else that tells me how powerful the Spirit of God is. But I, I'm getting choked up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oof. I felt like I had something holding me. Mm-hmm. That whole day. Mm-hmm. It was amazing. And I wasn't even a real believer then. I didn't go to yeah. church, nothing. I yeah. thought I was holding me. And they had a memorial service that day because everybody knew her. Mm-hmm. When I tell you everybody knew her, everybody in the whole town of the hell, the little little small town, and she was the kids, she coached everything. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't bring myself to go to the memorial because I was afraid I'd make it harder for them. Mm-hmm. And the people don't realize the twin, the part that makes it tough sometimes is... You look like them. Yes. It would hurt her kids too. Yeah. This is the part I share with people because they made it hard for me to deal with people that knew her. Yeah. And even the kids, they walk up in the doorway. Imagine your kid walk up the door and you start crying. They look at you and just start crying. Because they see Because they just see you, yeah. her, their mom and you, you know. Yeah. And so that was really hard. They would come to visit and they would just stop in the doorway mm-hmm. and start crying. And you were like, oh, like you feel like you're hurting them. Yeah, you know? yeah. And so that was always really tough. And so it was very, it was really interesting, you know, for years me trying to like be around her kids. Exactly. And, and you're not her though, because we do you, have some differences. Did you, you have know? anger? I like, did. What were some of the I know emotions? It's, that it was you... just sadness. Okay. That I still carry today. Mm-hmm. Sometimes. I still carry it today. It's, I was never angry. It's okay. this honest. It's an honest to goodness truth. And it's I know some people are really angry, but mm-hmm. I was not angry. How could I be angry when she wasn't angry? Yeah, yeah. How dare me? Mm-hmm. You know, how dare me be angry? And this person is just giving her everything she mm-hmm. got mm-hmm. to her last breath, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna be angry at what? Mm-hmm. I couldn't. I couldn't be angry. No. What you not said earlier was. So touching and so moving is when she said, why not me? Yeah. I think oftentimes we ask ourselves, why? Why am I going through this? Mm-hmm. Like, what when did I bad do stuff, to deserve this? When we perceive this? bad stuff, yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Like, what did I do to deserve this? Why? Mm-hmm. You know, You take the I good mean. with the bad, basically exactly. what she was saying. Exactly. Yeah, and, and she, never, she hardly never complained. This is why, this is why it is the one thing I can say in my life that completely... If that, and it's like, it's like the sacrifice of Jesus for us, mm-hmm. because if he didn't do that, we, where would we be? Right. And if, if something, and I'll, in a way I feel like she sacrificed her life for me because mm-hmm. had she not done that, I know I wouldn't be the person I am today. Mm-hmm. I know I wouldn't have mm-hmm. because watching that experience and her mindset about it has to change you. Yeah. You have a choice. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I suffered though for four years. I, I was like just grieving. Mm-hmm. Like I don't, I can't even express to people. <laughs> and I was just always it was a sadness that you can't explain in mm-hmm. a way I thought she's with me but it was still sad yeah cause you yeah you, it's hard to explain like to people twin yes, relationships exactly. it's just hard unless you're a twin I know yeah. you have twins so yes. you see it yeah but when one is gone it's like you always associate with this person yes right? uh, just a quick little story so I have boy girl twin and I always when I found out I was pregnant with twins I always I asked myself I said are they gonna be close because they're two different oh, yeah. they're not 
you they're not the same gender, right? Mm-hmm. Because I had seen relationship like yours and your sisters where it was the same gender gender and they were inseparable. Mm-hmm. Like I know this set of twins that went to co- the same college I went and they they were so close. You, you it was just mind blowing. They mm-hmm. had the same major. Mm-hmm. Like and I'm sitting I was just wondering how close are my twins going to be? Mm-hmm. Um and one day they were toddlers and one day Bryson came to me and he said I wish people would just stop calling me twin that is not my name <laughs> and I was just yeah. like no it's not but what they're saying is you came together you came else. together right. you're a, you're a package deal yeah. you know you're yeah. a two for one yeah. and he was just like and and I see them one of the, one of the things that um it was just one night they got there with up in the middle of the night they had been up you know just oh my gosh they finally went back to sleep and at that point at that point we were intent we we decided that we were not going to buy them different cribs mm-hmm. um that we were going to put them in the same crib together so they were sleeping in the same crib together wow. and i laid them down do you know as soon as i laid them down they rolled over and they just like towards each other yes. and just held on yes. to each other. Yes, yeah, I believe it. And they they woke up the next morning. Mm-hmm. They were still holding mm-hmm. on to each other, and I was just like, "You're in the womb for nine months with this person, you know." And you, it's a it's a spiritual connection. It's not it just is. a physical connection. It's also it a is. spiritual connection. I think people yeah. don't mm-hmm. realize that. And so I was I was still to this day feel like it carries with you. Yes, with your you'll yes. see it as mm-hmm. even as they get older. Mm-hmm. It's a spiritual connection. It's not. It's something very special. You yes. can't explain it to people yeah. what that's like. But mm-hmm. when it's, one is gone, it's yeah. We would identify as twins too. Yeah. But my mom didn't dress us alike, which was neat. Yeah. Because she realized we did have our own personalities. Mm-hmm. They used to call my sister the mean one. I was the nice one. What? Huh? But she wasn't mean at all. It was just <laughs> that she could be direct at times at a young age, and I think mm-hmm. that was part of her journey. Yes. You know, because of where she was going, she needed yeah. to get that skill quicker. It right. took me longer to get it because mm-hmm. they called me the softy, you know. Mm-hmm. And so when I think about the whole thing, I realize that that's how you know God prepares us. And so when I think about it, um, you know, after her passing and all the stuff that I went through, but it was like I feel like I was suffering for about four years, three or four mm-hmm. years. But then I had an event that kind of changed everything for me because I was trying to understand a lot of things and. How do I make sense of all of this? Mm-hmm. It wasn't anger, like I was telling you. It yeah. was just like just sadness. Yeah. Just complete sadness. I remember, you know, after I was married, had Rowan, we moved to Orlando at this mm-hmm. point. And I remember like my brother in law calling me because we had bought the house and she passed in January, we bought the house in February mm-hmm. and lived, moved to Orlando. I mean, yeah, moved to Orlando of 2020, 20, I mean, 2001. Mm hmm. So she died in January, we bought the house. And I bought this house with four bedrooms, thinking my sister, because at one point they were thinking about coming back to the States, and uh, I had more rooms. Yeah. So, you know, we had four bedrooms. We were thinking, oh, at least, you know, her and Eddie could come back if they wanted to transition back in the States. We'd have space for them. And so, obviously, she passed. And so I remember in February, we bought the house. Um, Eddie was calling me. I was dealing with things with the kids and... You know, my own husband, because I'm married. Obviously, mm-hmm. I got a husband in the house. Yeah. And my own daughter. And I feel like I had two husbands and three kids for a very long time. <laughs> because I'm, like, trying to, yes. you know, I mean, kind of be everything to everybody. Yes. And then my own grief. Right. Because you know? Eddie would call me crying almost every day. Oh. And that was hard, you yeah. know. And I remember one day sitting there going, my God, like, this is overwhelming because I'm dealing with my grief. Mm-hmm. And then I'm trying to help him mm-hmm. li- at least listen. Yeah. And then talk to the kids. And then I have my own husband and daughter, right? And I remember kind of like, and, and again, this is before my journey, my mm-hmm. Christian journey, I called it. I remember going out loud going, Jesus, or I said, I actually said, my sister. I said out loud, I said, Dan, you're going to have to help me out here. <laughs> I literally said, I said, this is too much. Yeah. I talked to my sister out loud. I was like, mm-hmm. you got to help me out. This is too much. Mm-hmm. I said, because I'm trying to manage almost like two households one's across the ocean and yeah. one's in orlando right how do i make this thing work because this is overwhelming and i'm still dealing with my own feelings yes. right carly this was like i would say it was like on a saturday or sunday the following wednesday this is gonna blow people's mind i was working for a credit union in uh in orlando at the time i think i've been working there i started in june so this is and I remember the phone ringing, and they said that somebody was on the line for you. Some lady who, who was at the switchboard calls me and says, I have this person on the phone. I didn't know who it was. Mm-hmm. And, and 
I picked up, I said, this is Tonya, a friend of mine, Minerva, who I'm going to send this to her because she'll remember vividly, who was sitting next to me, uh, my Cuban friend. And um, <laughs> my spicy friend, and she was like early 20s this time, like, you know, 34, 35, mm-hmm. very, still very chill at this point, mm-hmm. dealing with my grief. And she was the spicy one I used to call. <laughs> You gotta have that. And, uh, yeah, you that friend that always. Friend. And so the phone rings, and they're like, "This person is calling you." And I pick it up, and I won't give his name because he he might not appreciate that. But he was telling me I used to work with him, mm-hmm. this person, and he said he had a gift. Hmm. Okay. And he basically told me he said somebody's trying to reach you. Now I don't. On the first of all, I don't know how he got my knew where I work. Mm-hmm. And I was just blown away. So he said to me, he said, hey, um, this person is trying to contact you. I'm going I'm to tell you the story of what he said. This is going to blow your mind. He says to me, this person said that you would be open to hearing what I had to say. I said, okay. Okay. And so he is a, I don't want to give away, he's a professor of English. I won't tell you what school because I might give him away. Okay. Who has a gift. Mm-hmm. He calls me up. I used to work with him. I worked with him for two years. Mm-hmm. And he <laughs> he calls me, he said, he said, he said, Tony, this this person is real funny too. He said, I'm, he said, I'm walking. No, he said, I'm in the middle of a dead sleep. Mm-hmm. Three o'clock in the morning. He said, I woke him out of his sleep and gave him my name. Literally said, Tonya Peridin. And he says, I know a Tonya, but I, he knew me as Bowen, which mm-hmm. is my maiden name. Mm-hmm. He didn't know my married name. Mm-hmm. And he says, I don't even know a Tonya Peridin. He said, no, you know her. And then he said, I don't even know how to spell the name. And the spirit said, P-E-R-O-D-I-N. I I kid you not, Harley. Spelled my name. He said he sat up. He's an English professor. And he still teaches English to this day. He wrote it down. And he put it on his dresser. The next morning, he said, I'm walking off campus, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But no, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, he said. The voice came back to him and said, you need to call her. And he said... He said, I didn't know how to contact you. He said, what happened was I went back home and said, I didn't have to pick what your name was. I had to pick up the paper to figure out, you know, mm-hmm. your name again. He typed it in and there was an article in the Orlando Sentinel because it was talking about, it kind of told this story about my mm-hmm. sister passing, about me moving to Orlando to kind of get away from everything. And so the article popped up. In the article, it has, and it's still, you can check it. It has, it has my name and the two other people they wrote about. Mm-hmm. And then it says that I work for Belltel Credit Union. So he calls information. He gets the number for Bell's Hill Credit Union. And my phone rings 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That's how that went. And he told me, when I tell you, I was sobbing. Three days after I said that out loud. Mm -hmm. It was like, he basically told me, he said, you know, she loves you. And he said, I'm pretty sure it's your sister. And he didn't even know my sister died, honey. And that's why, this is the thing that changed me into this this calm person mm-hmm. because I said, how is that possible? Mm-hmm. How can that happen? Mm-hmm. You know, hardly oh, for a whole hour, he was basically rehashing my entire life. He knew about the Holland. He talked about tulips, talked about my niece and her braids and her hair. And, and, um, he talked about my sister taking my mom to Paris, which she had done a year earlier, wow. went to the Paris, the, which called the palace of Versailles. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when I tell you, he talked to my grandfather who met her, he said, my grandfather had died when I was in high school. John, he knew his name. Basically, called me on the phone to let me know she in good hands. She's always, and basically telling me, she with you. She's taking, she's helping to take care of you. God is with her. She's with you. You're in good hands. Mm-hmm. She's still going to keep an eye on you. And it was one thing, this is what always gets me, because for a whole hour this man talked, I still have the notes I kept. And I have it in with, you know, all my like important papers. And I wrote all this because I'm like scribbling stuff. He's writing it because mm-hmm. I'm silent, mm-hmm. not saying anything. When I say totally quiet, I was quiet. Now, at this point, I'm literally sobbing. And Minerva, my friend sitting next to me, is like, what is going on? Mm-hmm. And so she sees me writing all this stuff and she knows the story. So mm-hmm. she's like, and she starts crying. Mm. So she's next to me crying. I'm crying. <laughs> <laughs> we writing all these notes, and then he talked about everything. When I tell you everything, he he didn't miss a miss a beat. He talked about my sister's high school boyfriend's mother who had passed. Okay, so if you want confirmation, God's like, I'm gonna give you I mean, confirmation. Go, I mean, I'm gonna give you confirmation. Because you know so how much we are. Because so, you know how we, we don't are. believe it. And we I don't. Know, at that time, I didn't go to church. None yep. of that. So I was exactly. like, exactly. He about to slap me upside the head. <laughs> 
and tell me. Yes, he is. He's going to be like, you see what I'm saying? But no, I, it ain't finished yet. It's not done. So I was going to say, you're talking about a big, almost a punch in the face. You can't deny that, right? And so all these notes I wrote down, but there was something on there that was like, he everything kind of like meshed. Like I mm-hmm. understood all of the things he talked about, but he kept referring to a giraffe and this photo with, um, he said this black art. He kept saying black art. And I, I collected this all over my home if you mm-hmm. go in. Mm-hmm. But specifically, t- he talked about a picture of women in it being by a giraffe. And so I thought, and, he, and I kept saying, why? Well, he said it three times in the conversation about this giraffe, this giraffe thing and this picture. So I remember writing all this stuff down because I have three times the notes. He said giraffe in this picture. And so that was the only thing that didn't make sense to me. So this happened on, let's say, a Wednesday. I think it was a Wednesday. And the reason why I remember because I remember Saturday morning, me sitting up on the bed. So Thursday, I pick up the notes and I'm trying to figure out this giraffe and picture thing and Friday, I pick up those notes and I see this giraffe and picture. I'm like, why is this thing not coming together? What is this? Mm-hmm. This means something, it, right? Yes. It was the last piece of the puzzle kind right. of thing, right? And so on Saturday, I get up out of bed like I did for the last three days. And mm-hmm. I picked up these notes, picked up these notes, and I rotate off the bed. And I'm just sitting there looking at this note. This thing, this is that last little thing. What is mm-hmm. this, right? I look up. And I looked down and I just completely lost it. On my side of the bed, and my husband sees on the other side, my side of the bed, there's a picture on my side of the bed called Sisters in Prayer. Mm-hmm. He described the picture on the side of my bed and underneath it was a stuffed giraffe that I had purchased a week earlier from Kohl's. You know how the little $5 Kohl's animals from Kohl's for $5 that was sitting right underneath it. And what he was basically saying is, She is looking at me laying in the bed. She had never been to my house. She died before I bought my house. Carly, if you don't need any more confirmation that there's God. (laughs) It changed my life. Because, I mean, I was just like a mess. And when that happened, it was like my, it was like a switch clicked. And I rarely share this with people. He, she saw me laying on, uh, he didn't pick my husband's side of it. Mm-hmm. My side, the picture is still there to this day. Every time I move, I put that picture in the face. <laughs> yeah, like it's it like, is right there. If you yes. walk in my house now, it is laying. When I get out of bed, I flip you, my that's feet the first over thing? and that's the yes. picture that hangs. Yes. But at that time, there was a stuffed giraffe under it. He, ate, he described it, that she saw it. That's, that was the pivotal moment for me that changed my complete relationship with God. Because mm-hmm. he said, I see you. Now- if you ever question if there's a God, that right there. He said it. He said, I see you. Mm-hmm. I asked for help three days, a few days earlier. I said, God, I, this is too much. Mm-hmm. I need help. I was telling my sister and God, like, y'all need to help me out here because this is too much. <laughs> It's too much. Yeah. You know? And he was like, I'm going to get you so much help that I'm going to have to keep, I'm going to put you, make you quiet kind of thing. You're mm-hmm. not going to be able to say another word. You will always be able to testify mm-hmm. who I am. Mm-hmm. And it's like a whole piece came over me. My life was different after that. It was just completely different. He used to always tell me, the person that did all this, who explained all this, the guy who provided the gift, I always call it. Mm-hmm. He said people always thought it was evil. He don't want to, he don't want people to know. Which is fine with me. I respect that. Mm-hmm. But I don't agree with that. I feel like that thing was the reason why I relationship with God to this day. Mm-hmm. And so if it brings you closer to God, it is part. I feel like it's a part it's of him. It's a gift that be. he's given you. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Not how you choose to use it. Mm-hmm. It's different. Like, he doesn't use it for money. He's, exactly. I, he's never tried to make money off yeah. of it. And he always told me, if you ever need you know, need me, I'm here. I've never called him again. Mm-hmm. I still, I still, you know, I'm connected with him. Mm-hmm. I have him on my phone. But I never mm-hmm. need to call him again. But I said, God is real. Hmm. Say it again. God is real, I'm telling mm-hmm. you. And I think that was the pivotal point. Like I said, I've never been a person that went to church. My mom was like, mm-hmm. Easter and Christmas. And it's just like, this is the, we grew up in the Northeast. It wasn't something like the, the South. It's a little different. And so, for me, it was a, it saved my life. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like I was on, on my way to like yeah. being gone. Mm-hmm. 
and I still go through, you know, ebbs and flows and well, things yeah. that happen. Yes. But I always think about that moment and how that occurred. And when you really need him, he gonna come. He's through always for there. You. Mm-hmm. He is always there. Mm-hmm. Always there. I don't even know what to say after that. Like, what do what do you say after something like that? You don't. Yep, yeah, because you you know I I don't know to tell people and I. I've shared it with a few people, but I really feel like I think people question, oh, yeah. you know, their life and their and their relevance and their purpose. Mm-hmm. But I, as sure as I sit here, I tell you, God, if every hair on your head, He knows mm-hmm. what you're going through and what you need, and and that if you wake up and you have breath, He He ha- He needs you to do something. Yes, and mm-hmm. I have to remember that. And I'm and like part of me coming here, like to be a part of this and mm-hmm. the gift that you bring, right? Mm-hmm is hopefully sending that message to people yes. because I struggle even still today. I still go through my moments oh, yes. where I'm trying to figure out like, why am I here? Huh? <laughs> you know, what's listen, the purpose? Listen. Um, and it's been a complete transition for my life. Divorce mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. you know, my daughter moved out and she's doing her own thing mm-hmm. and being alone. But I think yeah. sometimes it actually brings you closer it does. to God because there's a sense of peace with that. I mean, yes. I told my daughter, the last, thing, the last thing that she's left is this dog. I'm like, come get your dog. <laughs> I ain't totally in tune yet. Let me come get that dog out of here. You know? <laughs> so like, I'm like, come get this dog mm-hmm. and, you know, so I can really be at peace. Right. So I can get one. Really dog. be alone. Have my peace and quiet. But I realized that even the alone time has brought me closer and I feel like yes. a really a sense of peace and what people see because people say you always seem so peaceful your house is peaceful mm-hmm. and that ain't nothing but God because mm-hmm. I'm like this on the inside sometimes mm-hmm. like, just like you were explaining mm-hmm. but it's just something I feel like he has a hand on you and he put yes. his hand on you yes it just yes yeah, everything goes it does it does what do you what do you feel like your purpose is to encourage people to mm-hmm. not give up. Mm-hmm. Because, when I, you know, I think about, and I sometimes, Harley, I'm so resistant to even being in leadership and stuff mm-hmm. because people misread me all the time because they think it's like I'm, unha- I'm not unhappy. It's mm-hmm. just that I'm super sensitive. And they consider me, I'm considered empath. I do some research oh, yeah. and understand mm-hmm. empath, mm-hmm. right? My sister was a very, she's empath magnified times 20. Mm-hmm. And so I pick up on a lot of people's feelings yep. and I get overwhelmed a lot. Yeah. And so I get silent uh-huh. because I can tell. Like, mm-hmm. that's why I start asking questions, start talking to people. Yeah. But it's more an individual basis, I was telling you. But I feel like the gift that God gave me, I think he gave me a gift to connect mm. because I don't think everybody has that. I think no, a natural, on a one-to-one don't. basis to yeah. really like tune into a yes. person and connect. Yes. You know, exactly. And I feel like that's for encouragement because there's so many things happen in the world. You're told you're not worthy. Mm-hmm. You don't have, a, you know, that. And you're not good the, enough. Yeah, the you lies of you don't have it. a purpose. Exactly. Or that you, you know, that you just created for whatever. No, it's it's that's very intentional yes. when you were, your mom and dad got together and you were created. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes when I um, think about my life, I'm grateful. Like I, I still, again, I still struggle. I'm not, I'm like a very human. I still struggle with understanding my purpose because it makes you very lonely. It's not mm-hmm. lonely alone mm-hmm. is a difference because people don't understand you. Yeah. They think, oh, she's mean or she's this. Yeah. I could be very direct. Uh huh. But if you listen to what I'm saying, you'll notice you'll see. it's with love. Exactly. And so I feel like God's purpose for me is, and it, it's it's encouragement. It's to connect with people, to show people that you really care. Like mm-hmm. there's people out here that actually, they're good people mm-hmm. that care about you. Mm-hmm. And they're not trying to take from you either. Mm-hmm. They're just giving of their heart without thinking, what am I getting back? How can yes. I get, you know, how can I, how can yeah. I benefit from this? Listen, you know? I, um, our dear friend Aisha, I say this because She's an incredible Up human in, being. Oh my going gosh. on record. So listen, you listen to this, Aisha. Yes, you go you like know on she top is. of my exactly. list of incredible human beings. But I had been pretty much every relationship that I've had with another woman ended badly. Mm-hmm. Outside of my sisters. Mm-hmm. Right? And they don't have a choice. Um, <laughs> They're kind of stuck with me anyway. <laughs> but, uh, but every relationship... A close relationship. Now, I'm not just talking about like people that you know, or whatever, but like relationship that I've had with another woman ended badly. Mm-hmm. And so I came to that place where I was like, women only want mm-hmm. 
they only want something from you. Mm -hmm. That's why they're your friends and that's why they befriend you is because they want something from you. It's not going to end well. It's it, And so that's how I felt. Mm -hmm. And then here comes Aisha, her little petite self coming along and it's like, and she's like, I'm like, what do you do? <laughs> you know, I was like, what, what do you do? And she was like, I, 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 my goal is to support women of color mm -hmm. and to come alongside them and really walk with them. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. I've seen, I've seen people talk the way you talk and yeah, it always ends up badly. Mm -hmm. Like been there, done that multiple times, got burned by the fire. She was like, without saying it, I'm going to show you. I'm mm -hmm. going to show you what that looks like. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you what it looks like when women, the power of women come together and we really support one another. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to show you what that looks like. And I was absolutely blown mm -hmm. away. I was like, it, it, you don't want anything from me? Like, you, you really don't want anything mm -hmm. from me? Nope. Nope. There's an expression I've seen that says, until it's my turn, I just clap. Ha! And so it's like, wow. that's, but that's the thing. It's like, that's the truth. That's how I feel about women. Because I feel like there's too many out here just worrying about what somebody else. I've never done that. My sister has a big, beautiful house. Mm -hmm. I never walked in her house thinking, I want what I she want has. That. I want that. I think it's I... beautiful. And it's so nice for them to have it. But mm -hmm. I know God has something for me. Exactly. And so I never compare myself yes. in that aspect. Like, yes. especially materialistic things. Exactly. Men. And we need to stop that. Exactly. And that's why I think I was blessed to encourage. But I think mm -hmm. part of me being encouraging is because of what I've been through, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we should we should Every story, every story, no every experience yeah. that you have been through, Tonya, has brought you, you to today. where you are mm -hmm. now. So, yeah. I, I mean, you are in a place, I am in a place where I'm just like, I'm blown away by where I am right now. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I, I, I'm, I am so thankful and mm -hmm. grateful for the experience that I've been through that has, that have led me here. If I tell God that, Hey, I want to follow my purpose. I want to walk in my purpose. Then I have to be open to whatever comes mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. Whatever comes with that. Mm -hmm. I just, you take it, it all. What, you have and, to. And it's really not what's happening. It's how you perceive what's happening. Exactly. So. Yeah. For sure. Wow. Okay. So we've reached our time. This is crazy. <laughs> I, and you would think I'd be used to this by now, but it's like, I'm always blown away. I'm like, wait a minute. What? It's It's been an hour. Okay. Mm. So that just goes to show that I just, I can talk forever. Me too. When it comes to this, when it yeah. comes to connection mm -hmm. and community and your voice and your purpose, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's just so amazing. So, um, is there anything that you want to leave the listeners with? Like any last? Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. My, my, my thing I would always tell people is trust God. Mm -hmm. Trust God mm -hmm. and learn how to surrender. Because I've had to learn how to oh. surrender a lot of things. Yeah. But I think the trust in God is the most important piece yes. and know that you are not, you were created on purpose mm -hmm. and that you deserve a beautiful life. God loves you and that you need to trust them. Mm -hmm. No and matter where up. it leads you, yeah. right? He's always going to be there. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. on that beautiful advice, I'm just going to end right here <laughs> and say... Thank you so much for coming on the pod and sharing your story, being vulnerable, showing people that now, you know, I challenge the listeners to say, when you're going through something now, say, why not me? Why not me? I get to, yeah. I get to show someone else that might be going through this. I get to show somebody, somebody else that's like, I think I'm the only one that can, I mean, I'm the only one that's going through this right now. I get to show someone and I get to be inspired and I get to motivate someone else that's going through this. So next time you go through something as hard as it sounds, tell yourself or ask yourself, why not me? Right? Absolutely. 
Okay, well, we actually drop new episodes every week. Okay, so I'm super excited because I'm about to hit my six month mark. This is oh, crazy. Very cool. I know. So six months since the pod has been in existence, and I am just, I, I just continue to see watch it evolve, and I just, I'm so grateful um, to have people like you come on the podcast and share their stories and experiences, and continuing to motivate and inspire people that are listening to this podcast. So I thank all the supporters, my listeners that listen day in and day out every single week. I really appreciate you all. Um, It's the holiday, so please make sure that you spend some time with your loved ones because you just never know. You you never know. Um, Spend time with them, um, enjoy them, hold them, hug them. And... um, as you know, every Monday we are dropping new episodes um, to the podcast, so make sure you tune in. And you know what I always say: can't live without, can't leave without saying this. But there's purpose in your story. There absolutely is. I hope you enjoyed our show today. Hit the subscribe button and share. Share this pod with your family, with your friends, with your girlfriends. And follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Inside the Bubble with HG. Keep the conversation going. Drop us a heart emoji. Engage with us. We would love to hear from you. New episodes are dropping every Monday on your podcast streaming platforms. And remember, there's purpose in your stories.